all know. For me and for us adoptees, that's the story. My name is. This is me on the left. The first picture of myself which I have taken in Pune in 1973. On the right is my record of birth, my birth certificate. That's me officially, Svaland. Legally. There was actually a German couple who desired to have a child. My then unmarried mother and me were together in a children's home in Pune. My adoptive parents filed an application for guardianship in the Bombay High Court. And thus, suddenly, I got a foster father, Michael Dole. I became Aaron Dole alias Svanand. This document, my Indian passport, was issued by the Indian government for the purpose to actually export me. Of course, I did later even lose the Indian citizenship and acquired German citizenship. I'm a German. I even looked like it, right? No? Okay. One could say already here that this was a clear-cut violation of my right to life, which is enshrined under the Constitution of India. The right to life is a duty to be fulfilled towards a child or any other human being to, within India. One cannot just export a child. Children actually have rights as citizens, rights versus the state they are born into. And here we are. A nice family. On the right is me, on the left is my adoptive sister, and we two brown children have two white parents. In Germany, we have something, it looks so good to see, but we have something, it's an official document which is called Family Book. It shows who's a member of that family. We can see on the left, left uh, upper right corner, my father, right, my mother, and below their fathers and their mothers. It's like a family tree. Technically, legally, theoretically, for all purposes, I'm born by a decision of authorities into a white family. To make matters worse, and that's in German, it's just to illustrate it, um, my adoptive parents, after taking to Germany, told the German authorities that I'm a foundling and that my mother abandoned me in the hospital. They did that while all the while it was clear from the paperwork, which they filed in the Bombay High Court, that I had a mother. The requirement, of course, under German family law would normally be that there is a consent of the mother. With this convenient lie, the requirement was circumvented and I was adopted without consent of my mother. This summarizes the legal process which erased my original identity. Literally, legally and practically, I got a new one. This happens to most adoptees. The legal process varies from adoption to adoption country. And I'm quite fortunate because I had a lot of papers and information. Many other adoptees have next to nothing. Or they may even have the mother's name and address yet don't know how to search abroad, or worse, that all the paperwork is concocted or fabricated. Scandal after scandal has been coming out over the decades, and now the adult adoptees are bringing out the old scandals again. Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Colombia, Chile, Ethiopia, Thailand, you name it. I think just by now looking together into the legal Documents will can see what tension this actually causes in adoptees or children, these two identities. Consciously or subconsciously, it has either way a huge effect. Often, we adoptees are labeled angry, as having attachment problems, as traumatized, and all sorts of things. However, maybe the fact that as a human being, one resists in a form or another to be forced to take up a new identity is actually something very healthy, very human and normal. Maybe it's society 
which actually has to take a fresh look into those practices before giving us any kind of label, is taking ownership of a child. There's no doubt for me that this is, is a form of contemporary slavery. However well the adoptive parents might have cared for the child. It has also forced migration. The slavery and trafficking definitions in international law have the requirement of exploitation. It is clear for me that trying to be white was very hard work. And I think I obviously failed. Adoptees have to do the labor to pretend to be as if born to the adoptive parent. That is actually really hard work. Thus, it's very inherently exploitative to the child. We can also say it's modern slavery. We can say, <laughs> uh, given the money transaction involved, we can definitely say it's a market in children driven by demand and supply. Or we can call it sale of children. Or we can call it trafficking in human beings. There are many ways of describing it. In 1999, I fully opened Pandora's box and started searching for my mother. I had already kind of started in 1993 or even earlier, but I was obviously too young for this complex venture. The driving force for the search and also for my today's work is the tension. That's the energy which is behind that. Um, I traveled many times to India. The first time, of course, I didn't know anything. I had no clue about the country I was born into. Don't know the language till date. Didn't know its culture, didn't know its people, etc. Actually, because I had to travel so many times to India to search for my mother, I even lost my German business over, the, uh, over all this. I did really put my full energy and capacity into the search for my own mother. What I then also discovered was that adoptions in general were not above board. It wasn't what I thought, just a noble act. I got in touch with other adoptees, tried to help them, saw their paperwork, how their identities had been erased or papers had been fabricated. One day, I got in touch with an Indian woman, a labor unionist and an activist. She belonged to a group of people who were fighting in Andhra Pradesh the international trade in Lambada babies. This was an eye-opener for me. Soon I figured out this was what is otherwise considered legitimate adoptions. Licensed, accredited Western agencies were involved. Also the, the well-respected International Social Service. This group of people suddenly opened a new world for me. New doors went open. With their help and contacts, I finally moved my own case to the, to the Bombay High Court. Seven years I had to fight through the judiciary, up to the Supreme Court of India. For what? Just to see my adoption file, my own adoption file, and get the name and address of my mother. Seven years fight. In between that, and because I also had so I had to attend every hearing and so I had to travel to India each time. I took up search cases for adoptees and I started exposing the trafficking, the current ongoing trafficking, like for example the notorious orphanage Preet Mandir in Pune. A documentary was made and the scandal was brought out in Denmark in 2007. Till date that scandal is unresolved. Or the infamous Malaysian social service in Chennai they kidnapped children and sent them to the Netherlands, US and Australia. We started assisting the parents, helped them to get a lawyer and file court cases. Finally, in 2007, the scandal came out in the Netherlands, really big time in the media with government investigations. It is still unresolved. Around the same time, around the same time, um, the EU civil servant, Ruli Post, had published her book, Romania for Export Only, the untold story of the Romanian orphans. So over this, we finally met. Me, the guy from the field, and the EU civil servant met up. Met up. And suddenly, I started understanding the issue. 
and many hours. Actually, days of phone talks, Rudy Post explained it to me. The policy issue, the social policy issue, of which I had no clue before. In short, it's all about big politics. And this is the Berlamo. This is the headquarters of the EU government. It's called the European Commission. But it's not to be mixed up with the Commission. It's really our government for the whole European Union. <coughs> It is one of the most powerful administrations in the world. And what had happened regarding children's rights and adoption? The EU had decided on the enlargement process. So the Eastern European countries wanted to become part of the EU. And to explain the EU in, in simple terms, one can say it's like a club of European member states. And every club has rules. We call it now the Lisbon Treaty, that's the formal term. The NGO is act against child trafficking. The NGO I do now had. We did a lot. It's just too much to list. We exposed scandal after scandal from India, Ethiopia, Malawi, China, etc. We had adoptees with searches. We did research, field research, we wrote articles. We assisted victims. Um, and documentaries have been made about it also. Sadly, this is harder to read, but it's the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. It's Article 8, and it basically states that state parties undertake to respect the right of the child to preserve or his or her identity. And then second, where a child is illegally deprived of some or all of the elements of his or her identity, state parties shall provide appropriate assistance and protection. Article 21b limits inter-country adoptions very severely. It says, basically, that intercountry adoptions are only permissible if there is no suitable manner of care available in a country. And that actually on micro level, not on, uh, on macro level, not on micro level. Because if you apply it on micro level, you can always argue a child from India, from a poor family, would be better off in the West, sure. But that's not how it is. Um, no one can tell me, for example, that India cannot care for its children. It's a lack of political will, and in any case, hilarious for a 1.3 billion people country to export, to export around 1,000 children per year. I find it just laughable. It is worse and even more damaging if the whole policy on children is framed around adoption and intercountry adoption. It's from the Indian government by now one of the main pillars. And same goes, sadly, for other countries too. Then there is a second convention the Hague Adoption Convention from 1993. And basically, this convention tries to do something else. They say we have to first try family preservation. It sounds nice, but family preservation is always limited. And if it doesn't work, we terminate parental rights. It could happen to anybody of you. And when the parental rights are terminated, the child will end up in an in-country adoption list. And if the child cannot be placed in a month or three, it will be put on an inter-country adoption list. We do not see, under the Hague Convention anymore, foster care or residential care as a suitable manner of care. There's a striving for permanency. And yeah, that creates a market in children. The latter convention is, of course, set up by the adoption lobby. I don't understand why that convention, being a private law convention, can override the UN Convention on the Right of the Child. It should normally not be able to override UN public law. But unfortunately, the way today's global policies on children are shaped now are in line with the Hague Adoption Convention in every country, also slowly in Germany. We are currently creating a global regulated market, market in children, formalized. Since 2004, since Romania closed, there have been efforts from the agencies and the NGO world to undermine the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child. One such thing are the so-called United Nations Guidelines on Alternative Care. This is Yabduk, former chairperson of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, one of the creators. And he is saying here essentially to an audience of child, uh, uh, ch uh, people from child rights NGOs, that he's reminding them that the 
UN guidelines have not been approved by the UN General Assembly. So, let that sink in. So we have guidelines, which are supposedly called UN guidelines, but they have not been approved, but rather just welcomed by the UN General Assembly. So they're neither binding, they're in fact nothing, and we shape the global policies on children after these guidelines, which I would say are fake. In 2016, in 2016, the Dutch Council of Criminal Justice and Protection of Juveniles advised the Dutch government to stop inter-country adoptions. This is based, this advice is, is based at least around 70 on 70% 70 of, of the work we did on exposing scandals, etc. And it is so significant because it wasn't an NGO. It's a formal independent government body and that in the host country of the Hague Adoption Convention. So, morally, we have won. The situation is clear. Also, inter-country adoptions are down 80% in the last years. We have participated in that. Yet, our founder, Rudi Post, has been fired by the European Commission last year summer and the European Commission demands also 100,000 euros from her. So that's currently a real overkill. We, the victims, the adoptees, and the original families still do not get any assistance from this anywhere. No apology, no compensation, and everything we do, like reconnecting families, has to be self-financed. There's a little light at the end of the tunnel. The Dutch Ministry of Justice is in process of setting up a commission in, to look into the adoptions from the past. And I have little trust, I have very little trust that they're really going to acknowledge the crimes committed, but we will, we, we will see. Me, my name, in 2010 I actually found my mother. We have contact, a rather good contact, sporadic, but a DNA test she doesn't agree to. And the rest you can actually Google. Thank you very much for your attention.